So in this paper, um, I take the case of the online community known as incels uh, as an example of failed intimacy in the digital world. So by this, uh, I don't merely mean that incels have failed themselves at intimacy, which of course, to a large extent they have, but also that incel is a result of a number of failures wrought by much wider social shifts relating to uh, the commodification as well as to the digital mediation of intimacy. Paradoxically, however, while incels often rail against this mainstream culture and economy, uh, they've also internalized many of its values in ways that render ideological and physical separation from it impossible. In this sense, the failure is doubled by their very real alienation and simultaneously by their failure to perceive the true causes of their alienation. So I use intimacy here in the sense intended by Laurent Berlin uh, as connections that we depend on for living, so not exclusively uh, sexual connections. So as Fiona Atwood and Jamie Haken pointed out in their special issue on mediated intimacies a couple of years ago, a range of intimacies have both been constrained and made possible by constantly evolving network technologies. In this paper, I present to the extent that it's possible in 20 minutes, a broad analysis of the various intimacies that digital technology has both prevented and facilitated for sexually disenfranchised men. In other words, the various ways in which technology has compensated for broader socioeconomic and personal failures, yet has failed to do so successfully. But firstly, for anyone unfamiliar with the incel phenomenon, I'll try to give a, uh, a brief overview. So incel culture is an online community of predominantly, if not exclusively, heterosexual men who are sexually unsuccessful. Incels are part of the Manosphere, which is a much broader network of anti-feminist and men's rights formations. These disparate, sometimes conflicting, oftentimes overlapping formations also include men's rights activists, which is a kind of generic term, uh, PUAs or pickup artists, MIGTOs, which are men going their own way, trad cons or traditional conservatives and no fappers, as well as other related peripheral, peripheral groups associated with the alt-right and the disinformation movement. So MRA is the uh, generic term for, uh, for men's rights. Uh, PUAs then are pickup artists. These came to public attention around uh, 2005 with the publication of Neil Strauss's book, The Game. And then since then, we've seen other figures uh, emerging, such as Strauss's mentor, the Canadian pickup artist, um, a Mystery, and other more controversial figures like Julien Blanc and Rouge V, who became a prominent figure in the Gamergate controversy of 2014. So this strand of men's rights has been central in the framing of the Manosphere's politics is centrally focused on the issue of male sexual entitlement. And it's piggybacked heavily on both the self-help and the influencer markets. It's important to note, however, that while a lot of PUA rhetoric seems quite bizarre and archaic in its insistence on evolutionary psychology or evo psych as they call it, it didn't come out of nowhere. So for at least a decade before their emergence, we were seeing a forceful return to biological determinism across a range of cultural discourses and products, from self-help literature to the marketing of everything from Budweiser to big pens. Nor is the concept of sex as transactional new, as the stage has, had already been set by a range of cultural texts, such as John Gray's Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and Fifty Shades of Grey, as Rachel O'Neill points out in her her insightful study of the UK seduction community. MIGTOs then are men going their own way. So unlike incels and um, PUAs, these are men who have decided to remove women from their lives entirely and advocate what they call a life of male sovereignty. So this doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have sex. Some advocate having sex with or even marrying non-Western women. But key to the MIGTO philosophy is saying no to the demands of Western gynocentricism and carving out an existence based on the American myth of rugged individualism. So they would have some continuities with the earlier mythopoetic movement of the 1990s, uh, popularized by John, uh, Robert Bly's book, um, Iron John. Trad cons then are traditional conservatives lean toward more conservative values. You can see here 
the uh, the connotations of military abstinence from alcohol and uh, moralism bound up in in the values of the of the family. So these be more typical Trump supporters and. Uh, gun ownership advocates, for example. And then we have No Fappers, an online support community for men who want to abstain from masturbation and pornography use with a view to improving their testosterone levels and rebooting their sexual power. Um, it's also a very misogynistic and uh, anti-Semitic space, which the right has deliberately targeted. So one of the tenets of the Proud Boys, for example, is hashtag no wanks meaning masturbation is forbidden and a sign of weakness. Uh, David Duke, associated with the Ku Klux Klan on white supremacy, also suggested that pornography was a Jewish conspiracy intended to serve as a weapon of revenge against European white men and societies. So in general, the Manosphere is characterized by a number of features which are distinct from pre-internet men's rights groups. In other words, when men's rights migrated online, um, and more significantly, when they migrated to Web 2.0, we saw a number of sig significant shifts. So from connective politics to connective politics, from the political to the realm of the cultural, from a human rights-based agenda to a discourse that is centered heavily on emotion and personal pain and suffering, um, from a preoccupation with kind of broader sociological issues to to preoccupation with this key theme of sexual entitlement and also then the pseudoscientific theories derived from evolutionary psychology. And perhaps most important of all of these, the move towards extreme misogyny, whereby it's become normal to refer uh, to women as thoughts, which are, stands for that how over there, roasties, uh, foids, etc. And then the normalization of this uh, extreme violence against women, even in mainstream, sites such as Urban Dictionary. We also see increasingly a conflation with broader ideological narratives such as great replacement theory and uh, the belief that white masculinity and by extension Western civilization is under threat, a disdain for leftists and what they call cultural Marxism and sometimes anti-globalist sentiments. So Intel's share most, if not all of these features, but they're also different in a number of significant ways. They believe they're the losers in the genetic lottery because they believe that women are responsible for sexual selection based entirely on looks and also to a slightly lesser extent money. Their destiny as sexually deselected men, as they call themselves, is immutable. So most threads or about perceived injustices. For example, they see women hypersexualizing themselves everywhere, uh, which they refer to as teasing or blue balling men. Yet men, they argue, are guilt tripped into being asexual high inhib drones as one misstep could destroy their life and reputation. So basically they claim to live in a cocked soy society, as they call it, um, that is slave to foids, a slave to women. And this is simultaneously biologically ordained by the whole kind of Evo psych um, philosophy, but it's also the fault of feminism, which they argue has enabled women to have reproductive and commitment free sex. So some incels are red pilled and that they continue to try and self improve while most are black pilled, which means that they've given up all hope and frequently talk about suicide and sometimes engage in fantasies of revenge. So incels are related in various ways to other manosphere formations. For example, as Jack Bridge and Sarah Banevisor have argued, it was to a large extent disillusionment with the failed promises of pickup artists that drove many men to seek out this more fatalistic uh, incel uh, identity and community of the black pill. Already this gives us an important insight into the first failure, namely the commodification of intimacy, which has become an ever more significant part of mainstream culture since the incursion of social media and dating apps into our lives. Thus, while a lot of PUA and incel rhetoric seems bizarre and archaic in its, in, in its insistence on Evo Psych and at best ambivalent approach to consent, it didn't come out of nowhere. So for at least a decade before PUA's uh, and incels came to public attention, we were seeing this return to biological um, determinism, as I say. And this concept of sex as transactional was part of this shift. It had become kind of popularized in post-feminist um, culture uh, already. Um, so piggybacking on the, on the burgeoning self-help industry of the 90s and noughties, PUAs were key, therefore, to the framing of men's rights politics as focused on this concept of sexual entitlement. 
despite its evocation then of a pre-modern kind of Arcadia, the Manosphere's interpretation of ego psych is remarkably attuned to the discourse of neoliberal economics. Does people, women, are rated out of 10. They are talked about as having certain value in the sexual marketplace. And then seduction manuals use terms as buyer seller dynamic, the buying temperature, compliance threshold, epiphany chains, unique selling proposition, number crunching and closing interactions, all very kind of marketing oriented um, language. So a recurrent trope in the manosphere is that of alpha fox beta box, which means that women seek out alphas for sex, but if unable to hold onto one in the long term, they'll settle for a beta to pay the bills and raise their children. And then after marriage, they will probably continue to cook this beta by sleeping with alphas. So these are beta orbiters that, you know, kind of uh, hang around uh, Stacey's um, hoping for some action, but really Stacey's are only interested in chads. So incels don't even get this opportunity because their female looks matches monkey branch up to betas. So this injustice is a recurring, if not defining, feature on incel threads, and often the solution proposed is enforced monogamy. These are, are uh, quotes from, or this is a quote from a, a thread about how unfair it is that other, but because a lot of incels um, identify as uh, auto, having autism, how unfair it is that female uh, autists um, don't have the same um, predicament that they do. So a potato with Crayola makeup and 600 pound land whale live life on tutorial mode. This means tutorial mode comes from gaming, refers to how easy life is for women. Um, this is nothing new that autist girls also have it easy. They can make a living off Twitch simps or OnlyFans. And again, this reference here to the commodification uh, and transactional nature of sex, which women are seen to have an unfair advantage in this marketplace as well. So the fusion of, um, of Evo, Evo Psych with the marketization of sex is uh, well illustrated by the case of thought audit. This is just, you know, this is the kind of meme we see all the time is all about how unfair it is, what men have to achieve in order to attract a partner. For women, all they have to do is not be a land whale. So um, the case of thought audit, I think is a really uh, interesting um, example of how these discourses of uh, evolutionary psychology and the marketization of sex become fused. Thought audit, um, which is an event that happened in 2018, involved a whole load of MRAs and incels in the US reporting online sex workers or cam girls to the US Inland Revenue Service on grounds that these women were alleged not to be declaring earnings from their pay-per-view videos for tax. So according to a uh, former pickup artist, Rouge V, who pops up everywhere uh, since Gamergate and all of these kinds of uh, attacks. He, uh, who was in, he was instrumental in garnering support among incels for this attack. So this is what he said. These girls are getting a free ride via better books and a broken sexual marketplace that is rigged in favor of females. So while it's unlikely that there were many successful reports made to the Inland Revenue Service, the campaign caused Instagram and other social media companies to block many of these women's accounts. So the case of thought audit is instructive because it affords insights into the contradictions inherent in incel mentality surrounding pornography. While a lot of the incel forums contain large amounts of porn and image-based uh, bulletin boards such as 4chan, advertise hardcore pornography using GIFs, there's also a strong sense of anger and resentment about women who are monetizing something that these men believe that they're entitled to for free. At the height of this incident, Rouge V tweeted, why do so many young men of the thought audit feel resentful of young women who want to sell nudes without consequence? Because those men understand at a deep lizard brain level that those women are a danger to the integrity of the tribe. So this really bizarre uh, conflation of, you know, really kind of primal Evo psych stuff with this idea that they have this completely unfair um, position in the sexual marketplace. So this understanding of sex as transactional is clearly one of the conditions that has led to and sustains the incel phenomenon, but it's not the only factor. 
It has to work in conjunction with intimacy failures in the personal circumstances of the individual. For example, social isolation and a lack of close male friendship. The insights of ex-incels are especially revealing um, in, these, in this regard. So I've been looking at a lot of uh, ex-incel threads and forums where ex-incels talk about how they got into it and how they got out of it. And they're really insightful and reflective on a lot of the kind of misguided ideas that they had. So one, one guy says, the truth is it comes down to a major insecurity issues and a lack of any male relationships. Again, this is a, a clear intimacy fail, right? If you don't have many different male friends, you're going to assume that only the cocky guys get the girls. In reality, they're displaying charisma and confidence, something that's very attractive. So it's lack of awareness. It's easier to say to yourself, you're too short, too ugly, too untalented, etc., than to admit that you have a crappy personality with little to no charisma. You won't find a happy, charming incel. So in the narrative, uh, or in the narratives of ex incels, this social isolation almost always goes back to school and to the failure to conform to heteronormative ideals of masculinity in relation to physical ability, sport and popularity. Histories of bullying are common and then of a, of a, a subsequent retreat into the mediated worlds of gaming and other online communities. From there then the transformation or the transition to NEAT uh, not in education, employment or training, is often relatively seamless, a precarious place to be in a neoliberal techno-capitalist economy which fragments its subjects into expendable units of labour and in which the social safety net is fast disappearing. So for the neat male, the hallmarks of traditional masculinity and marriageability, property ownership and a career for life are no longer available. So given all this, the alternative intimacies offered by the digital echo chambers of the red pill and black pill philosophies are deeply attractive. Here incels find what Jacob Johansson refers to as antisocial sociability, the kind of ambient intimacy described by uh, Reichelt, but in this case in the cultic milieu of various anti-woman, anti-globalist, anti-progressive and anti-immigration formations. So according to Colin Campbell, who developed this concept of the cultic milieu back in 1972. This is the broader cultural landscape characterized by ideological heterogeneity and syncretism, which allows cultic groups to emerge. It's a useful concept because it describes well the dynamic formations of a disparate or, or of disparate ideological groups, which coalesce and disband around a plethora of loosely connected ideas from great replacement theory and anti-globalism to esoteric neo-paganism uh, neo and anti-feminism, as well as deep state conspiracies. So the internal psychodynamics of these communities are subcultures closely resemble those of a cult. They're transitory, they lack hierarchical structure, and they attract members with very different individual trajectories. They also offer the intimacy forged by in-groupness, as well as the transformative experience of being pilled. So inside the echo chamber, neat scientific explanations appear to make sense of the world, and the construction of outgroups then enables members to redirect their self-loathing outwards onto targets such as Stacey's and Chad's. Women are lo no longer then in this rhetoric real people, but they become a kind of dehumanized archetype referred to as femoids or foids, roasties, thoughts, ameriskanks and cum dumpsters. This communal mood of seekership, as Campbell described it, provides transitory validation, community and most importantly intimacy or the illusion thereof. However, even though they're perceived by their users as strong tie networks, these are transient and weak tie networks, very similar to those in which uh, pro-anorexia and other online negative enabling support groups operate as observed by Haas et al. According to many ex-incels, the false security that comes from being told it's not your fault creates kind of detrimental holding pattern, delaying or preventing normal psychosexual development. In other words, the time that should have been spent experimenting uh, experiencing rejection and learning from those experiences has instead been spent in this kind of perpetual circle jerk, which both excuses and fetishizes celibacy. For one commenter on an incel thread, 
it is precisely this communality afforded by social media that denies incels the solitude to reflect alone. So this comment comes from a Gen Xer who says he would have definitely been an incel had he been born um, in, in Gen, a Gen Z or Gen Y. So social media, he says, has destroyed, even eroded the concepts of privacy Gen X and before took for granted. For us to be an outsider, to be weird, was something you could do alone and grow out of if you wanted to, of course. For the later millennials and beyond, even in quarantine, there's no alone, no solitude to reflect. Everything seems to be out there looking for likes and other forms of validation. So he makes a really interesting distinction, I think, between um, solitude as a, as a kind of important um, emotional state and, and loneliness or social isolation. In addition to this, incels preoccupation with physicality as the basis for all sexual attraction and by extension social success has led to something of an ambiguous relationship with gym culture, going uh, back as far as 1997. In a study of young unemployed men from the West Midlands in England, Chris Haywood and Marcin Machangal found that although unable to work with their bodies, these men could validate their masculinities by working on their bodies. More than two decades later, the instability of the labour market, the rise of self-improvement culture and the proliferation of image-based platforms such as Instagram has intensified this culture of gaining social status through working on the body. Incels are generally highly critical of this culture, what they call lookism, or discrimination against people who do not conform to idealised standards of attractiveness. Despite the fact that they critically subject women and indeed themselves, Themselves to these evaluative criteria. They thus both affirm uh, or desire neoliberal ideology, this kind of having to look good, using ratings based on looks, uh, being a successful male uh, in both sexual and economic terms. Um, you know, they affirm this as, as the norm, and yet they also consciously critique and reject it as superficial uh, and damaging. These contradictions extend into their uh, relationship with physical um, self-improvement or looks maxing as they call it. So some maintain hope, the, the red pillars, in the possibility of personal transformation, turning to steroids very often, bodybuilding, referred to as gym selling, um, jaw exercises to improve their jawline because this is seen as the kind of basis of, of physical uh, attraction, and in rare cases invasive jaw surgery. Others see working out as a useful means of coping but most maintain that it is futile, especially as the gym cannot increase your height. So there's a lot of kind of commentary on the um, on the threads about um, you know what gym selling will and will not do for us. I'll use myself as an example. I've been weight training for well over a decade now. I've increased in strength and physical aggression to the point where I could just about match any chad out there. I've also learned how to box. However, with that being said. I, like most of you, was born ugly. Despite having a powerful muscular physique, I'm still an incel. Women are still not interested in me. Gym selling is thus not, at least in my own experience, going to enable us to get a hot girlfriend or even an average looking girlfriend. I'm blackpilling you guys already, I know, but this is the cold hard truth. And then the response, you will probably continue to rot as an incel. Uh, but the change in power dynamics, once you start lifting is legit. The appearance of being a meathead thug, even if you are high inhibition like me and have no actual capacity for violence, is the great equalizer in this world. The racism, the snobbery, the classism, the lookism, all of it means nothing if you're a hulking mass next to somebody half your size. They won't say shit to you ever. This advice is extra legit if you're tall and if you have a good frame, makes life slightly less unbearable. So these are all their kind of strategies for coping. And then another commenter says, no gym for your height, I'll never be anything but an overcompensating midget. So these discussions go on and on and on, but whether or not there's any point in, in, um, in gym selling. And the conclusion usually is that really there isn't. It's certainly not going to, um, it's certainly not going to get you um, a female. So as with PUA, uh, therefore, 
this promise of individual self-improvement fails, resulting in despair, uh, a return to theories of evolutionary fatalism, and ultimately collective rage uh, against women. Thus the incel response to neoliberal ideology is deeply contradictory, both in relation to how uh, evolutionary psycho psychology becomes woven into a commercialization of sex logic, but also in the simultaneous internalization and rejection of lookism. In many ways, therefore, incels call uh, the various calls that they make for things like enforced monogamy or sex robots, uh, or even just the recognition of their plight, are forms of what Jamie Hakem calls intimacy struggles. But unlike the uh, the intimacy struggles that Jamie Hakem talks about in relation to gay men's demands for recognition of non-monogamy, for example, here we see a very kind of misguided example um, uh, and very counter-progressive example of intimacy struggles. Exiting the community uh, usually require, requires what uh, you might call an intimacy breakthrough of some sort in the form of usually striking up a relationship with a real woman actually talking to a woman and realizing that they're they're actually people until then however it is either an endless quest to ascend so ascending meaning um, becoming successful with a woman or resignation to a life of loneliness in this last stop psychic uh, space of the black pill a false sense of intimacy is forged through the kind of effectively charged personal narratives that Papa Teresi describes of despair, self-loathing and revenge. Displaying some striking similarities to pro-anorexia communities, black-pilled incels detach entirely from aspirations to sexual intimacy, turning their frustration and anxiety inwards on their own bodily imperfections and then outward on sexually successful women and men or Chads and Stacey's. In this sense, we can consider black-pilled incels as simultaneously a dangerous political faction of the manosphere, as well as part of the human collateral damage wrought by techno-capitalism. Thank you.